You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We present Given in Evidence by John Fryer with Emma Hounsell, Ellen Jackson, Jeff Bainham and Zig Stanieshak. A small disc, the size of an ashtray set on the tabletop, with the keys to the car outside, and next to that a figure of Christ on a cross stood roughly a foot tall. Dangling around the neck of the crucified man was a silver crucifix on a chain. She recognised it immediately as matching the bracelet found on the victim, the missing one from Deborah Ann Jones. The WPC steps into the hall to get a closer look. She then stretches out her hand to touch. Who the hell are you? What you doing in my house? I've had Mr. Clarence's solicitor in here all morning. Illegal search, breaking and entering, harassment are just some of the colourful expressions that have filled this office thanks to you. Forget charges, Jenkins. You'd be lucky not to lose your job. I'm sorry, sir. I wasn't thinking. Not thinking? You're on the force. You can't do anything without thinking it through. You don't get up in the morning without having a plan. You don't put your hat on your head without thinking. And you never, never enter and search a suspect's property without a warrant. You may have found the family of the person who killed Deborah Ann, but it is now all inadmissible in court. Get out of my office. Only two of the Clarences could drive. The father, George, who had plenty of witnesses to swear he was in the local boozer at the time of the murder, and the son, Peter. At least one of Deborah Ann's friends said that Peter had pulled up in his father's car at the school gates and spoke to her. That day, Deborah was meant to have attended netball practice, but hadn't turned up. By the time DCI Williams did get a warrant to search the house, the chain of evidence had disappeared. The Ford Cortina had been into the local garage to be repainted, the mud washed off, and the damage repaired by a panel beater. The CID knew who it was, but could no longer prove it. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, but for the moment there is little we can do. But wait. Wait? Wait for what? For more evidence to turn up. And tell me, Inspector, how long will that evidence take to present itself? I know this is difficult. We have to wait for Peter Clarence to do it again, don't we? That is one way, yes. My father was at the Somme. Did you know that? I saw the picture, sir, above your mantelpiece. He would have known what to do. In a situation like this, they were people of action. We ask ourselves, what would we have done if we had found ourselves in their place? Today, we are civilized people. Today, we wear shirts and ties. What would your father have done, Mr. Jones? What he considered to be right. I'll see you out, Chief Inspector. Thank you for coming, Alice, and dragging up my skeletons from the past. Your family and you will always be welcome in my house, but could you leave it for a while, please, before your next visit? I'll get your coat. And this is where it started to get really interesting. This was the point where I couldn't stop reading Michael Cake's file. Well, you enjoy reading his files, dear, but I now have to go to the shops before they close. You see, between the death of Deborah Ann and the disappearance of Peter Clarence, Terry Jones presented himself at the Finchley Police Station, asking to be taken to DCI Williams' office to speak to DCI Williams, DS Cake and the young WPC who had illegally entered the Clarence family home. You'll find him in the park. Find who? Mr Jones? I saw him by the school gates, talking to the girls. I knew then that he'd do it again. He'll keep doing it. He won't stop. Maybe he's got a taste for it now. I know what his brief will say in court. 
mentally unstable, not fit to stand trial, couldn't help himself, all the fault of society. You must have heard it all yourselves many times. The whole family's unstable. The daughter's not right herself either, I believe. The whole area knows them. Well, the adults, anyway. The kids? Kids are always impressed with anyone who has a car, even if it's not theirs. And even sensible girls like my Debbie can go off with bad boys. They say it happens all the time. I wouldn't know. What did you do, Mr. Jones? I couldn't wait, you see. I couldn't put another father and mother through what we've been through. Does that make sense to you? Where is he, Mr. Jones? He's out of the way. In the bushes by the fountain. He'll be found at first light, I would think. How exactly? With this. My father's service revolver. He brought it back with him. It was a different world then. It still works. Works very well. Made to last, to endure, for when the time was right. When you would need it. I needed it tonight. Stay here, Mr. Jones. We'll take a look for ourselves. WBC Jenkins, stay here with Mr. Jones. No trouble now, sir. There are plenty of officers right outside this door. There's not much in Cake's file about what happened next other than a reference to disgust situation. So I'm guessing as to how it happened next, but I think DCI Williams had already made his decision before they arrived in the park. There's his feet. <sighs> yeah. I suppose we should get forensics in. What would we do, Mike, if the woman in our lives was taken from us by some mindless thug? We'd want him dead. Not to go to prison? I would believe that I had failed to protect her. I'd want him dead. So, I believe, would you. What man wouldn't? I asked you once, were you religious? No, thank God. After all the things we've seen, I don't believe someone watches over us. Me neither. There's only us, no one else. If there is justice in this world, which I doubt, then it will only come from us. Then we can't pin this on the Almighty. What is it? What do you want to do? I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, that we've been so long. You appear to be mistaken. What? We've searched the park thoroughly. And we can find no trace of a body. That, that's not possible. I have come to the conclusion, Mr. Jones, that you've been under quite understandable stress following the unfortunate death of your daughter. I believe that is why you may be under the illusion that something has happened this evening, for which there is no evidence. I have the gun. What? Gun? The gun. The weapon that has been sitting on your desk for the last two hours. Oh, I never saw a gun. Don't be ridiculous. It's been in front of me since you went to the park. There's no firearm on the desk, sir. You, young lady, tell them you saw it. You could smell the powder from it being fired. Tell them you saw it. Well, WPC Jenkins? I don't recall seeing a gun, sir. DS Cake? Sir? Do you recall this meeting? What meeting, sir? You're all involved. This is a cover-up. Justice takes many forms, Mr. Jones. Sometimes it's via the courts, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just ordinary people who do what they believe is right, for the benefit of society at large. Good night, Mr. Jones. It's late. Safe journey home. I tracked down Peter Clarence's sister, Lorraine. Strange individual, I thought. Not well. Cancer. Not well in the head either, I would say. I asked her what she recalled from that time. Do you know she still lives in the same house with several cats? We were only nippers, see? Only nippers? 
playing games, always playing games. And one day, me and Peter, we started playing. I dare you. Silly now, I think back. He dared me to nick some chocolate from the local sweet shop. I dared him to get some bubble gum. By the end, the dares were really good. He dared me to break in and steal a radio from a house in Worthing Street. I was almost caught and all. But I was quick in them days. And I knew what would happen if I was caught red-handed. Then I see all them posh girls at school. They were all in the top classes. I was always in the stupid classes, the bottom set. I hated them, with all their airs and graces. But I knew. I knew what they were really like, what they really wanted. So I knew what dare to give Peter when it was my turn next. And I did. Peter had just passed his driving test. Father rarely used it, so I told him I said it right to his face. Go and pick one of them tarts that show themselves off on the netball court. Show them the car. They'll soon go with you. Make her scream, Peter. Make her scream. But Peter didn't understand what I meant. He was a bit stupid, see, and instead of having his wicked way, he took this girl way out of London and he made her scream in a different way. He left her so she'd be in the paper, so I'd know that he'd done it. That was clever, that was. But he was always one for the church, was Peter. So he took Mum's vegetable oil to give the silly girl the last rites. And he took her necklace, which was thick as some even more stupid female copper came into the house uninvited and found it. Father then got rid of everything, saying that you lot would one day be back. But you people never did come back. And one day, even Peter himself stopped coming back home. Do you think Peter will come back home now? I was going to tell him that he didn't have to do it. It was only a dare. Of course, Peter Clarence was never found. And in no time at all, the attention of the police moved on. However, there was an interesting side note that I found in a Finchley paper at the time about the local crematorium. The owner, a Mr Phillips, reported that someone had very carefully broken in during the night and ignited the mechanism. Apparently, there had been several funerals the previous day and he hadn't yet cleaned out all the ash. He wondered if that might have had something to do with it working during the night, but he doubted it. Anyway, he cleaned it all out in the morning. Didn't you get promoted not long after that? Margaret, sit down, please. Yes, sir. You know what happened here tonight? Yes, sir, I do. How do you feel about that? Will I be called upon to give evidence? Will there be an internal investigation? If Mr. Jones makes an official complaint. I joined the force to be a police officer, not a typist, not a shoulder for others to cry on. How many more notes do you want me to type up, sir? You're going to fit into the murder squad very well. Thank you, sir. We all live with burdens, Alice. Even you on some occasion might be required to look the other way. Or you'll tell yourself that you won't. But sometimes, just sometimes, you'll come to believe that the means really do justify the ends. Life isn't goodies and baddies, with the goodies always abiding by the rules. Sometimes for the goodies to win, things take place that you might not agree with. How you learn to live with that burden? This is one of the things that will define your life. If you think what Williams and Kate did was wrong, tell the whole world, then see if the world cares. If your version of events is true, then ask yourself, for whose benefit is it to bring this to light after all these years? I know which side I was on, Alice. Whose side are you on? Or are you only on your own side and looking for your next promotion? Margaret Mary Ashburton. 
I'm arresting you on suspicion of aiding and abetting to conceal the death of Peter Clarence in 1975. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. In given in evidence. Ellen Jackson was Margaret. Emma Hounsell was Alice. Jeff Bainham was DCI Williams. Zig Stenyeshak was DS Cake. Ian Sterling was Terry Jones. Annabel Spinks Jones was Young Margaret. Willow Connell was the pathologist. And Juliet Vaughan Turner was Lorraine. Artwork for the production was by Sheila Jackson. And the play was written and directed by John Fryer. Given in Evidence is an audio production for Political Art.